Sorry. <laughs> Let's get back to some of these subjects. I was asked the question, um, firstly, with the... So, so I said I'd tell you about that later, about the brain, soul and mind of soulmates um, in terms of how they interact. If you could think of you, yourself... Well, I might use a different colour. So here's yourself or, and your soulmate. Remembering that each of you have a brain, hopefully, <laughs> somebody said, and a mind, you definitely got a brain, yep, and you definitely got a spirit body mind too, no matter how much you use it, it's still there. And um, of course your soulmate, uh, also has a spirit body and a physical body. Now this is something to bear in mind, if we can say that. Can you see that the mind, if you stay in your mind, your mind exists in the spirit body's form, and your brain exists in the physical body's form, can you see that if you stay in your brain, you will always be separate from your soulmate? And can you see if you stay in your mind, you will always be separate from your soulmate? It's impossible to actually merge if you stay in those places. But if you connect to your soul, your own, so the female connects to her soul, her half of the soul, and the male connects to his half of the soul, now there's a, com there's, a, there's a combining thing that starts to occur and that is you finish up having one mind, if you like, the mind of your soul. So the closer you get together, so the closer you join in truth, the closer the two halves of the soul become until they join. Once they join, and this is why it takes longer to, to become a soul mate in the soulmate union than it does to become at one with God. To become at one with God, one half of the soul becomes at one with God in the sense that they now have received enough divine love to make the transition completely into their own soul. But the other half of the soul hasn't. And even if the other soul, half of the soul does do that, so in other words, they make their transition towards God as well, and they become at one with God, there is still the process where they need to become at one with each other and finish up having one mind, the mind of the soul. In other words, they need to join at the soul level in order to have one mind. Now, imagine that that happened for a moment. So you'd, it would be like having a soul mind. Now, the soul mind exists in the entire of the soul, not in its two halves. Do you understand? It needs both halves of the soul in order to function. The soul's mind needs both halves of the soul in order to actually function. And so therefore both halves of the soul need to join in order for the soul's mind to fully function. Right. And now that takes a lot longer than it does to become at one with God because it requires the will of both halves to actually join. Now in that place, can you see another reason too why it's pointless staying in your mind? Like if you stay in your mind the other half of the soul is never going to be fully joined with you, ever, if you stay in your mind. But if you release this as the controlling force over your life, and you release this as the controlling force over your life, this is now the controlling force over your life, the soul. Now your soul has the ability to merge with the other half of itself and still retain full functionality. Right? But if you have this in place, there's going to be a temptation to always revert to your own mind. In other words, to revert to your own desire to control your own life, rather than 
allowing your unified soul to control both halves. In other words, your unified soul to control all four bodies. The two male and the two female bodies. The, the physical and spiritual bodies of both. Now, it's a fairly... I, I don't know if any of you are really following at the soul level what that would even be conceptually like, but I wanted to get a, say that to you because while you hold on to your mind for dear life, or even worse, hold on to the facade that the mind creates for dear life, you have no chance to ever fully connect to your own soul, but also you preclude your own soulmate from ever connecting to your own soul. Which, which is a very counterproductive action if you wish to develop spiritually. Does everyone get that? And uh, often we are totally into counterproductive actions. <laughs> you know, we do them all the time, unfortunately. But when you can see that the soul is the thing that is the only thing possibly possi with the possibility of actually joining, and the mind of the bodies are really a secondary to that, once we've released the mind of the bodies and we're no longer focused on developing them ourselves but we're focused on developing our soul, we then have a higher likelihood of firstly finding our soulmate but secondly joining with them. Much higher likelihood of doing so. And the minds of both spirit bodies, in other words all the memories that we have retained that are still in the mind, as they get absorbed into the soul more and more we get to a point where all of the memories are in the soul and when the soul joins I remember all of Mary's memories and Mary remembers all of my memories and I feel the memory of all of her memories and she would feel the memory of all of my memories. Does that make sense? On a feeling level, it's like you were there, feeling it as it was happening to you. That's what it feels like. And that's eventually what happens when you're in the soul union condition that happens, where you have a complete merging of all memories and all experience into one unified whole. Yeah? We have a mic right up the back with Alex and then down to Ian over on the side there. St uh, let's start with Alex. Yeah. Uh, is it possible for you to, for us, to process emotions, the emotions of our soulmate? To process the... To sorry. process the emotions of our soulmate. If you're saying that we get to a point where we, can, we know all their stuff, everything that's happening to them, and we can feel that. Can we process their emotion for them? No, no Alex. Um, it'd be nice if we could, yeah. um, but we can't because it, it involves the will of our soulmate. And if, if our soulmate has not the will to own her own emotions, then she is still living in her mind. And vice versa, if the male is not willing to process his own emotions about his own life then he is still willing uh, using his mind and he is still using his will to avoid himself and to join we must understand that we cannot avoid ourselves we must connect to ourselves before we can join to another and uh, and to do that we need to go through the process emotionally of joining to ourselves yeah Ian, thanks. Just inf no, no, you had it right. I, I, I assume that process is the same for male, male, female, of course, yeah. female. I'm just using mates. sort of male, female as an example. Yeah. It's the same whether it's whether it's the you know the two females or or the two males makes no difference. Um, it's the same process. And it requires that each half owns their own emotion, that they actually fully connect to themselves, their own passions, their own desires. And then in doing so, they, ironically what they do is they open themselves up. Firstly, they're opening themselves up to God. They're opening themselves up to themselves. 
but because they're opening themselves up to themselves, they're automatically opening themselves up to their soulmate. Now, if you try it, many of you are trying this, you're trying to stay close to yourself and at the same time have your soulmate come. Right? And that is an impossibility at the soul level to perform. You cannot stay close to yourself and at the same time have your soulmate come and be open to you. Does, it, does that make sense to everyone? For, for your soulmate to be open to you, you must first be open to yourself. And if you're not, if you're closing down a certain part of yourself to yourself, you're also closing that part of yourself down to your soulmate at the same time. Yeah? Does everyone get that? Yeah? Um, if we come down to them, please. So. forgot the question but I've got a better one um maybe um oh yeah does it mean that 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 uh, I'm just a bit confused about the at one minute I'll go through all my pain to get to one minute but if I then merge with Gary in the 22nd sphere do I feel the pain that his mother caused him and vice versa well you'll feel all the memories of it and you'll feel the you can feel choose to feel the emotions he had at the time but he no longer has them in himself so you won't feel it as pain, you'll actually just feel it as a memory or an experience. Does that make sense? Yeah. The only reason why we actually feel any memory as pain is because we still have the pain inside of us. So once you've released the pain inside of you, you will be able to remember any memory without it being painful, even though the original memory was painful. So for example, Let's say you'd been abused as a child. If you release all of the emotions about having been abused as a child, you will still be able to remember the event, but you will have no pain associated with the memory at all. It will just be like see seeing it happen without the pain associated. So, if we, And if I can give you some other examples, sometimes now when myself and Mary watch a movie, if it's, a, if it's an emotion that I've dealt with a lot, or dealt with almost completely, I'll watch the movie and I'll, there'll be no pain associated with the movie at all and Mary will cry through most of it. And then she'll look at me and go, why aren't you crying? <laughs> like, and the reality is that if I watched it in the past, I probably would have. Um, but, but now I've released most of those emotions, I don't have that same pain. Does that make sense? Um, so I can watch the same events but not feel the same feelings as a result. So now if I watch uh, something like A Walk to Remember, which is a movie that I used to watch quite frequently and cry every single time, now when I watch it, it's just like, oh yeah, no worries. They're like, it's just a watching a movie now with no emotion in it because the emotion that I had has all been released about that particular subject. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 The other thing I've been noticing is um, like Gary and I can have the same injury, some, some similar injuries, at, like for example being blunt, you know, um, it, which is possibly a positive and a negative. Mm -hmm. um, but it kind of quizzes me like, oh, how come we've got the same injuries? And as you know, our mothers were very similar. Mm -hmm. Um, you'll find that uh, in the two halves of the soul, there are very similar characteristics and attributes and personality traits. That's the reality. Now, how those characteristics and attributes and personality traits get damaged determines what we'd normally do with them when we're in a damaged condition. But as we become more and more pure, we'll find that we actually do exactly the same things with those particular personality traits generally, except one will be, in a, in a case of a male-female, one will be more feminine than the other in terms of the way in which the particular trait is, it comes out of us. But it'll be very, very similar. We'd have very, very similar opinion to each other, in fact, on the particular issue. Once the er errors are released, there'll be a very, very similar position inside of the soul on both issues. So the more soulmates progress, the stronger their bond becomes, but also their, strong, their, their, their positioning becomes very similar on a lot of different issues also, as a result of one just being the feminine expression of the whole soul and the other being the masculine expression of the whole soul. Mm. And the fact that we have similar injuries is kind of weird to me. Is that because... Um, similar injuries are a bit different, Deb, because that's all to do with how our parents and our environment treated us, and sometimes we got treated the same, and sometimes we got treated very differently. Mm. 
So where we got treated the same, if the two halves of the soul got treated the same or similarly, then they'll have a very similar injury set to each other. And that's a bit hard for two halves of the soul because, um, because what happens is you can be stagnant quite easily if you've both got the same injuries and you're, therefore you're both in agreement. So if the two halves of the soul have the same injuries from a similar circumstances from childhood and they have the same personality traits because the two halves of the soul do, then it's highly likely that the two of them will sit very comfortably in their injury rather than challenge their injury. And this is why working towards God is so important because there will become a time in your relationship with your soulmate where you're happy with each other's injuries if you're not careful and you're happy for each other to retain their current injuries because they're in agreement with yours and that's not a very good place to be if you still want to keep progressing towards God. Yeah. Okay. I kind of suspected, maybe, I don't know, if I was floating around while Gary was with his mum and I went, let's choose a similar mum or we're similar, so... Well, remember, you didn't have self-awareness, so it's impossible for you to choose I a similar mum. Yeah. Does that make sense? However, the personality traits of your soul will be attracted by a similar mother because of her erroneous condition. Do you see the difference? Can you say that again? The personality traits of your soul, the reason why you got attracted to your parents is here's your soul in its unincarnated state before you incarnate. It doesn't have any self-awareness. But when your parents, so your parents got together, had sex, right, and created the little baby that you incarnated into, right, their emotional condition cause an attraction of your soul in order to trigger their emotional condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, in order for them to grow, they needed you in their life. Do you, do you follow me? Mm -hmm. So they need a soul with your characteristics and traits. Now, the same goes on your soulmate's side. His mum and dad obviously must have had a similar <laughs> set to you yeah, that's him, so I'll just draw a man there. His mum and dad must have had a similar set of injuries to you to attract the masculine part of your characteristics, right. if you like. Right. Yeah. Only it's the feminine part, oh, I've drawn it the wrong way around, but anyway, and it's only the feminine part that was attracted on one side, the masculine part the other, but you both have a very similar per personality traits in your soul that God created, and the parents must have had just the right emotional set to attract that particular soul into their life in order for them to deal with their emotions and get closer to God. That's how God's designed the entire incarnation process. And so for that reason, there's a high likelihood of one or both of your parents having very similar emotions. Yep, gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah, yep. thank you. But it's not because you chose them. Yep, yep. Angela, thank you. Um, yeah, sure. If our soul has, our mind, our um, spirit body mind has developed up to the 23rd sphere. Spirit body mind can't. Um, you mean our soul's mind? Uh, doesn't our spirit mind, doesn't the mind develop as well? It doesn't at all. It's, oh, that's right. No, the spirit body's right. mind does not that's develop right. any further than the sixth dimension. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Beyond that, it's the soul's mind that is developing and the soul itself that is developing. Yeah. And because of that, uh, it's impossible for a spirit's mind to change substantially except by what it receives from the soul's mind. So the soul becomes a dominant thing. Remember I said it in the end, the process that we're following is there's our soul, here's our mind, and here's our brain, we have them in that order, right? Once we're in a union state, this is how that will look. Right? Yeah, but that's the soul mind. This is the spirit body's mind, is totally dominated by the soul itself, and the soul has its own mind in its, com in its joined state. 
Isn't it sometimes referred to, though, as the mind of the soul? Like it becomes a, like a soul? Yeah, mind? in the Paget messages, yeah. we occasionally refer to it as the mind of the soul. Yeah. Yep. 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 Lord Ann, thanks. Um, going back to um, soulmate relations um, in terms of if you know that um, you're in a, a relationship which is living in sympathetic error, so addictive. Um, I might try to ask. Um, uh, I've sort of asked this before, but it's not clear to me. Um, if you decide to separate and you haven't dealt with things because you're in different different stages, one doesn't want to process and the other one is having trouble processing. Yeah. Um, if you separate and you haven't dealt with it, you're going to continue in the spirit, in the sleep state, doing things anyway, you know, damaging. So, and on earth too. Yeah, on earth, but you're not at least physically together. Yeah. Um, it's... Do you, I know I asked this before, but um, is, it, is it wiser it, it to stay apart just so that you don't create more havoc than staying together? So is it wiser to stay apart or stay together? Yeah, you know what I mean. No. Yes. Well, what myself and Mary to do is we try to stay together as long as possible dealing with as much as possible as we can and then when we feel that there's an emotion that comes up that's impossible to deal with when the other person is not around because of the nature of the emotion so for example we give you one example where let's say mary's frightened she's very resistive to dealing with her fear let's say this is just an example and she wants a male to make her fear go away so that's the emotion she has then when we're living together, I could keep on triggering her fear or stating the truth. Truth always exposes fear. But if Mary is still quite resistive to feeling the frightened feeling that she has, then it may be better for us to be apart until she works her way through that particular frightened feeling. And then we can come back together again. But while we're together, the only way that we're going to stay together harmoniously is if I pander to her frightened emotion or a fear, and she likes that. That's the only way that we're going to stay together. But that would be a stagnant place if, if we want to work towards God. So can you see some emotions, it's better for us to stay together even though we'd like to be apart. And other emotions, it's better for us to be apart even though we'd like to stay together. So we can't give a rule as to when's the best time to stay together and which is the best time to stay, go apart. And what you're wanting from me is a rule. And I can't give you one. What you need to do is you need to analyse the situation and ask yourself, am I feeding my addiction by staying together? So let me write this down. So we're looking at the feeding of addictions. Now, feeding addictions always prevents me getting closer to God and always prevents me getting closer to myself. So if I feed, so for example, if I had a strong longing to overeat all the time and, and I overeat all the time, then I'm never going to get closer to God. I need to confront my longing to overeat all the time and then underneath that I'll realise that it's to do with different things emotionally that are going on inside of myself that cause me to overeat and I'll start to get close to them and now I've got to get a chance of getting closer to God. But if I overeat every time I have a feeling to overeat and I just go ahead and do it, I'm never going to get any closer. I'm always going to stay in the same cycle of overeating, overeating. Eventually I'll get larger, of course, and I'll overeat more and overeat more. And it's only when my fear generally kicks in greater on another subject that I'll stop. That's no good for me if I want to progress towards God. So feeding addictions is not good if you want to progress towards God or to even be yourself. Even if you want to be your true self, feeding your addictions isn't the best way to go about it. What we need to do is confront our addictions, right? 
Now, the question we need to ask then is, is staying together confronting my addictions? If it is, then I'm better off staying together. Can you see that? So if staying together, confronts the addiction, then stay. Right. The second thing is if, if, I'm trying to skip to three already, if leaving confronts the addiction, then leave, at least temporarily. Does that make sense? So if staying together confronts my addiction, then stay, at least temporarily. If leaving confronts my addiction, then leave, at least temporarily. Right? Now, you can even know your soulmates and still decide to go through this process of staying, and then you realise that, no, I'm stagnant now, we need to do something different, and so you might leave, and then you might come back, and then you might leave and come back, and eventually, eventually you'll stay 90% of the time, and then when you become at one with God, probably you'll stay together 100% of the time. Does that make sense? But this process needs to happen of, you need to ask yourself the question, am I feeding my addictions, or am I confronting my addictions by staying? If I'm, if I'm staying and, and, and just happily staying in my addictions, then that's not going to help me get closer to myself, closer to my soulmate, or closer to God. Mary, you wanted to say as well? Do you want to come over to here and say, say it? Because you want to talk sure. to... Um, I just... Um, I totally agree. And as you know, sometimes we stay and sometimes we go apart. Sorry, not much voice today. But if I... you just hold it about there, there yeah. Yeah, because you're ringing a bit. That's I fine. tend to think of it not as confronting the addiction, but is my staying together promoting truth, love and love and God in the relationship, which if it is, then it's confronting my addictions. So just to put that in context, because sometimes um, I've observed people putting themselves in situations where they think, I'm going to do this to confront my addiction, but there's no love and truth in the situation. So um, if, I'm in a, if I'm in a place or if, I'm, if we're working in the relationship and it's promoting truth between us, love between us and connection to God between us, that's automatically going to be confronting our addictions and it's worth staying together because we're going to grow to, towards each other and towards God. Um, whereas, uh, do you understand what the differential I'm trying to make yeah, there? I'm, yeah. I'm, Sorry. I'm uh, assuming that love and truth is always the goal, whereas well, Mary's, that's what I Mary's stating that, yeah you, need, not always, yeah, you need to do it because of those reasons. Yeah. Like, it's no good staying with somebody just because you want to confront an addiction in a selfish manner. You stay with them because you want to join with them and you want to have love and truth with them and you want to have a relationship with them, not because you want something selfishly met inside of yourself, including confronting an addiction, which would be a selfish thing. Just to, just to stay in a relationship, just to confront an addiction is a selfish thing. You'd want to have love and truth. I want to have a relationship with Mary. I want to love her. I want to stay in truth with her. And on top of that, I ask myself the question, do I want to stay in addiction? If I want to stay in addiction or this is feeding my addiction, then I need to do something about it. I need to do something different than feed my addiction. If it's confronting my addiction and I'm staying in love and truth and I still have a desire, then it's perfect to stay in the relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll hop down now, but just for example, I know you want to ask another question, but uh, I have run across people who say, I'm with this person, I know they're not my soulmate, but it's all good because we're working through our stuff. My big alarm bell around that is, don't you desire to join with this person, to love them, to grow in truth? Um, because if you did, it would really matter that you're not soulmates, so yeah. Which is a de very different uh, statement than what Mary made three years ago, if you remember. It is. 
I must have changed. <laughs> <laughs> so three years ago, she said, if you're, with, if you're not with your soulmate, then it's good if you're still just... You're working through your issues. Yeah. Exactly the polar opposite of what I just, just said, said, actually. Yeah. If you watch the soulmate and relationships DVD, yeah. you'll see me say that. Yeah. yeah, whereas I feel completely what Mary just said now, and I've always pretty much felt that. that yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I'll whereas, whereas, yeah, I just feel... I feel that it's very, very important to make sure that you really want... Like, if you really want your soulmate, you wouldn't stay with a person who you know isn't your soulmate, who you know isn't your soulmate, I should say. Not think isn't your soulmate, which are two different things. Do you follow? Yeah. So, so you, would, you would definitely stay with a person if you, if you didn't know and you loved them and you cared about them, you would definitely stay with them until such time as you know. But if you know that they're not your soulmate and you find it's really good to stay in the relationship with them, I suggest you're already in an addiction with the person anyway that you probably need to confront by leaving if you know for certain that they're your soulmate. Does that make sense? Yeah. But you have to know for certain for that to work. Yeah. Uh I don't know for certain if he's my soulmate. Mm -hmm. I just feel more and more he might be my soulmate. Yep. And I don't want to be in the relationship with him. That's why I have this... Why? See, see I'd put to you, if, if somebody's your soulmate, you would definitely want to be in a relationship with them. Uh, I think... However, yeah. you would not want to be in a relationship with them if you're getting treated badly or, you know, or something like that. So, but you'd still want a relationship with them. I want a relationship with him, but I feel I've got this error that is very much like, he's not my ideal, this and that and this and that, right? Uh, All yes. these things. And you, you see, Lorleen, you don't want to be with him. That's the reality. Mary has the same reality, by the way. Mary doesn't want to be with me at the moment either. And that's why I thought we'd come together, because I thought... I don't really want this relationship, but I feel that intellectually, I can't feel it yet, so intellectually I was going... You're getting very, very complicated, Lorne. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want the man? So here's the man. <laughs> Do you want your soulmate? I believe I do. No, you do not. <laughs> you do not. You've just stated you do not. Because you don't like who he is, and you don't like what he is, and you don't like the kind of person he is, and you don't go for that kind of person, and so forth, right? Like at the moment, Mary does not want me either, and the reason why she doesn't is because to have me, she's got a lot of grief to feel, and she doesn't want to feel the grief, right? To have your soul, mate, what are you going to have to do? If this guy's your soul, mate, to have him, what are you going to have to do? You don't even know, do you? <laughs> no, I don't. No. And, and this is the problem that many of us are facing, right? The reality is, this is what's going on. Here's the two halves of the soul. For most of us, this is what's happening. And this is something that's been happening with myself and Mary for some time as well, by the way, so we're not excluding us from this discussion. Here's the two halves of the soul. And there are emotions in each half of the soul, not thoughts, not thoughts. There are emotions in each half of the soul that oppose or cause the soul to want to separate from itself. So in other words, there are emotions in Mary that cause me to want to withdraw and there's emotions in me that cause Mary want to want to withdraw. There's emotions within Mary that causes Mary to want to withdraw and there's some emotions within me that cause me to want to withdraw. So there's four different things that I just stated. You'll have to listen to that again to get them all. And, and what happens is those emotions cause the soul to push itself apart. Right? And we're perfectly okay with that, many of us. are perfectly okay with the soul pushing itself apart because we don't want to deal with different emotions. So for, so for myself and Mary at the moment, it's primarily the emotion of grief 
Well, actually, probably for Mary, it's primarily the emotion of fear, isn't it, at the moment, that causes you to want to withdraw. A fear of your own, the extent of your own grief. And for me, it's, it's grief that causes me to want to withdraw, right? Now, unless I'm prepared to feel my grief, and Mary's prepared to feel her fear and grief, we, we cannot get together. It doesn't matter how physically we're together, we're not getting together. And also, as a result of it, we are basically repelling each other, pushing each other away. So if, if we were then asked, do you really want your soul, mate? The question would have to be, well, if I don't want my fear and I don't want my grief, then I don't want myself. And what did I just state before? You've got to want yourself before you can actually feel any want for your soulmate. Do you see? So, so we, we need to feel these feelings and not just need to, we need to want to feel them. Right? So Mary's getting to a point now where she's wanting to feel her grief and I'm in the point where I am, I'm feeling my grief and that will join us, that will have the opposite effect. So here's what that will do, that will point me in that direction and that will point Mary in that direction. Does that make sense? If we do that. Now for the majority of us what we're doing is we're saying, oh, a lot of us are rejecting the other half of ourselves. We're not happy with them. Many of you ladies are doing this when we talk to you, and many of the guys too are doing this, where you're not really sure whether that person, you find them really attractive or whatever else. But primarily the main reason why you're rejecting your soulmate is because you're rejecting your own emotion. You're not allowing yourself to feel your own emotion fully and particularly feel the grief and fear that's within fully. And as a result, that just keeps you apart. It doesn't allow a joining to occur. The only way a joining can occur is for each half of the soul to get rid of its own resistance to, to its own emotion. And its own resistance to the other half of itself. Right? In other words, the own resistance to the... the the other half, your soulmate's emotion. That's the only way you're going to join. So that requires me releasing or desiring to release my own emotion and being willing to accept Mary as she is right now, fully in my heart. Not perfected Mary, but Mary as she is right now. That's what I need to be able to do emotionally for us to join. And Mary, to join with me, she needs to do the same thing for her emotionally, where she needs to be able to feel all of her own emotion and then also feel open to my emotion. And when we feel those two things, there's four things now occurring and we'll be pulled together automatically. If one of us does not feel one of those things, then there is an impediment to ever joining to ever being closer. Mm -hmm. Now the beauty of working through your stuff with God is that God is not injured. So God does not have an emotional injury about openness to your love. So whenever you give God love, God automatically accepts it. God doesn't go, no, I don't want that love from you because I'm scared. Or God doesn't go, no, I don't want that love for you because I don't like you very much. Or, I don't want that love from you because that means I have to be with you. God doesn't do any of those things because God's not afraid and God's not angry. God's not controlling. God doesn't feel shame. And so God doesn't have any of those injuries. So when I have a feeling of love towards God, that feeling just transmits into God's soul. It comes out of my soul and enters God's soul because God has no resistance to love. And God has no resistance to giving love either, right? So there's love constantly coming out of God's soul for you, constantly, all the time. There's no let up, 24 by 7. It doesn't change when you go to sleep, because as you learned last week, you're not asleep anyway. So, so, so the reality is it's a soul-based thing, and it happens constantly. God wants to give her love to you. The only thing that can prevent God's love from entering you is you. 
And the only thing that can prevent your love from mentoring God is you. <laughs> right? So you can see that if you can patch up your relationship with God and be able to receive love completely and give love completely, can you see now it's highly unlikely that uh, you'll be not able to do the same thing with your soulmate. You'll be able to give and receive love completely. Yeah? Can you see that? Yeah. So, so God has no injuries in love. If I'm not receiving God's love, it's got nothing to do with God's lack of desire for me. And God has no injuries receiving your love. See, many of you have not even contemplated that you can give God love or that God even wants it. Right? But, but to fully heal your own love life with God, you've got to get into a stage where you want to love God too as well as receive love from God. Now, if you do both of those things, then your soul will no longer have the blockages to love that it had before. And once it hasn't got the blockages to love, once it's got no longer a barrier to it, now it's also open to giving and receiving love from your soulmate. Both. It's not just about receiving, it's also about the giving of love to your soulmate. It's now open because it's also open towards giving and receiving love to God. Does everyone follow that? Yep. So, so for our soul to join, we need to actually have a pure desire in our soul for us to feel all of our own emotions. And when you say, I don't know if I want to be with him because I don't really like him that much or something like that, you were demonstrating that you do not have a pure desire to really be fully open to all of your own emotions. And so therefore you are repelling your soulmate. And if you're repelling your soulmate, you don't really want to be with him, so why be with him? You might as well stay apart. And I've actually said that to Mary as well. Like, there's no point Mary being with me if she doesn't really desire to be with me. And she's only here because she feels we might be soulmates. Well, that's not a good reason to stay with somebody. Does that make sense? Yep. A good reason to stay with somebody is because you desire to love them and you desire to receive their love. That's a very good reason to stay with them. In fact, it's the only good reason to stay with them is because you desire to love them and you desire their love from them. Uh, not demand, which is a different set of emotions altogether. Desire. Demand was when you don't get the love from them, you get all upset with them. Yeah, that's the demand. Uh, if you desire, you can desire love without receiving it and yet not be angry. Right? So that's, that's desire. There's a big difference between those two emotions. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have any more questions about the soulmate issues yet? Yeah, Alex, you do? So let's go up to the back there. Um, I just want to ask, um, when I go into emotions about my soulmate, it always goes into my mother stuff. Yep. Does it at any point actually involve my soulmate? Um, the only time it will at any point involve your soulmate is if there are things your soulmate is currently doing that actually are harmful to your soul. Um, and therefore, and if you're open to receiving those particular things in your soul, then you will feel harmed in your soul about what's happening. Now, can I maybe give an illustration of that? Um, for the, let's, no, let's clarify it a bit further and I'll give the illustration. The majority of emo in your first incarnation, so this applies for your first incarnation, the majority of the emotions you feel towards your soulmate have nothing to do with your soulmate but have everything to do with two sets of emotions. The first set of emotions are how you feel about your mother, in your case. The second set of emotions, oh, there's four sets of emotions actually. The second set of emotions are how you feel your dad felt towards your mother. 
Do you understand? How you felt, your dad felt towards your mother. The third set of emotions that affect you are how you felt, your mother felt towards your father. And the fourth set of emotions are how you felt, your father felt towards you. And every one of those emotions, those four groups of emotions, has an effect on either how you see yourself or on how you see your soulmate and your relationship with your soulmate with yourself. So those four groups of emotions are all related to your parents and have nothing to do with your soulmate, but they do have a lot to do with yourself and how you see yourself. Now the only time that you may have emotions, causal emotions, related to your soulmate that you need to address are uh, when you have either been with your soulmate or, sh you know, or you have begun a relationship of some kind in the past and certain things have happened in that relationship which have been damaging to one or both of your souls because of the choices you've made that are unloving. And you will certainly have to process your way through some of those things. So for example, let's say that you've been with your soulmate for 10 years, but, but nine years ago your soulmate cheated on you and you didn't know. Your soul would know, right? So there's an injury inside of the soul regarding the infidelity that would have to be dealt with. And even, and even if you um, were... Like the only time that that would not be the case is if you were at one with God when the infidelity occurred because you would have already known that it had occurred at that particular point in time. Do you follow me? But aside from that, you will have some injury about that particular infidelity that you would have to feel. But the infidelity would be related also to some kind of attraction that your soul has attracted based on past events prior to then. So there will be a relationship. It will lead you back to something in your childhood probably as well. So it is possible that you do have emotions to deal with with your soulmate, particularly if you've been with your soulmate in the past. But the majority of the times, you will mostly have those four sets of emotions that I've listed. Now, for a person who's reincarnated, it's very different to that. Because yourself and your soulmate have a history together often 2,000 years or longer history together and therefore with a lot of different experiences. Now if some of those experiences were on earth in a condition of sin for one or both of you, then there will be filters through your parents and also the filter of just even being torn apart again to reincarnate is enough of an emotional barrier for soulmate halves who are reincarnated to actually have an issue with their soulmate. So the reality for me is that most of my women issues are not to do with my mother, but are actually to do with Mary. And the reality for Mary is that most of her unhealed issues are not to do with her mother and father, or the same goes with myself, not to do with her mother and father, but actually do with me and, and God. Uh, it's exactly the same for both of us. So for us, when we have a soulmate issue to address, usually it's with each other, rather than with our parents, which is very different than for yourself. It actually makes it a little more difficult to do that because you can't remind yourself this is about my parent because it's actually not. It's usually about your soulmate anyway. So it's a bit more difficult uh, because the soulmate has done something or you've done something to harm her. But uh, for, so for a person who's reincarnated, it's a little different, but most of you, well, all of you here don't really need to worry about that. So. I was just feeling, um, with those four points that you said, um, with those four sets of emotions, yep. if I actually sat down and wrote a list, list about all of those four things, you could actually quite get into quite a lot of stuff there, couldn't you? You could, yeah. yeah. It's a very intellectual way, though, of addressing it, um, Alex. In the end, if you allow, your, your soul is, remember, your soul is this great big attractor through the law of attraction, bringing these things to you on a daily basis anyway. Yeah. So, so the reality is a lot of times you don't have to go out to discover them because every single day it's being brought to you, emotionally being brought to you through your soul's condition. So a lot of times we don't have to go and write them all down because it's already happening in our day-to-day -day life and it's just a matter of us becoming aware of it. Yeah.
But there's no harm in writing it down and discovering it that way. And sometimes it can help with awareness. Yep. Thanks. Yep. There was someone down here, Rita, was it? Yeah, just down the front here. You just have to watch the... You have to come down the side, that's all. Um, I have been doing a lot of thinking and writing right now. And the question is, how do I become aware what is coming out of me or what is coming out of my soul? And to frame that, if, if people or if I do something and I think it's good, and, but it's not in harmony with what my soul desires. So can you give me some clarity about it? Sure. Um, it, it almost relates to this question that I've left on the board a bit too. Mm -hmm. So imagine you're a, half, you're a half of the soul like that, Rita, right? So you're the feminine half of your soul. So we'll just put that there like so. You can think of that as a great big antenna, right? So imagine yourself as a great big antenna emitting all of this energy coming off of it out to the universe. That's your soul. Whatever the injury is, or, and whatever the good things are, by the way, it's, it's the same, it's emitting. And then remember that's your condition, which is a total of all of your beliefs, your feelings, understandings, and, and emotions, and so forth, desires, passions, and longings, all of that together. So there's your soul emitting like a great big antenna out to the universe. Everything, some of it what you would classify as loving and good, and some of it that you'd classify as unloving and not so good. Yeah. Right? Now, the law of attraction, God's law, the law of attraction, is constantly bringing you things, telling you the truth. So, if you think you're admitting something good, and what appears to be coming back to you isn't so good, yeah. then you need to question. Hmm. There's something going on here because normally, if something was if, if something was coming out of my soul that was all good, then it would make sense that only good can come back, right? And that is a reality, actually, that only good can come back. Now, if I'm emitting something that's not so good, then of course other things are going to come back, things that are not so good to tell us things. Now, if I'm sensitive to the, what the law of attraction is bringing to me at any one point in time, then I'll realise, even though I think that thing coming out of me is good, that it can't be as good as what I think if what's coming back is not so good. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Now, the big problem most of us have in this case is our ego, right? Because we want to hold on to what we think is good. Because we believe with our whole heart that it's good, that we know what's good and it's good, and we've come to a certain understanding inside of us that it is good. And it has worked before the divine love path. And it worked before, yeah. So that, it, there's another thing. So it worked before, and a lot of things used to work before don't work so well anymore. <laughs> so, so there's something wrong with that. And this is where a lot of people go, yeah, I don't like the divine love path. I don't think it's true. I don't think it's real. I don't think it's right. Because a lot of the things coming back now are a complete reflection of what the soul is. You see, the stronger we set our intention emotionally to actually allow the law of attraction to be seen by ourselves, the higher the likelihood is that we'll have a stronger reflection of it. So the more we want to progress, the more intense our um, soul attracts things through the law of attraction. Because what we're doing, there's a second law that comes into operation once we set our intention in a certain direction, and that is the law of desire. Now, if you add the law of attraction to the law of desire, now you've got a huge powerhouse bringing you things all the time. Make sense? For many of us before, we, were, we had the law of attraction with no desire to know. So the law of attraction, all these different things are happening around us, and we go, oh, yeah, that's because of their condition. Oh, yeah, I've just got to love them more. Oh, yeah, that's because of this or other. We explained away all of the things that were happening to us by somebody else doing it. 
generally, or the universe doing it, or some other, something external to ourselves anyway. But as soon as we're kicking the law of desire on the divine love path, we're now attracting events, the law of attraction, we're now attracting them, and we intensely want to attract them, because if we can attract them as rapidly as we can, it also means that we can deal with things as rapidly as we can and grow more, more rapidly towards God. But unfortunately, like I said, our ego has a tendency then to kick into place. And we go, we go, see that bad thing there, that thing that's unloving? Well, we believe that's loving. And we believe with our whole heart it's loving. So, for example, I went down the street the other day and I helped Joe Blow with his car because he needed some help with his car. And that was a very loving act right, that I did. Not understanding that we're addicted to helping people Right? And the reason why we're addicted to helping people is because we want people to say, oh, you're such a nice fella. Right? And that's the only reason why I did it, really, because I wanted to be here that I was a nice fella. And if he had told me, I don't like what you just did, and I don't ever want you to do it again, we would have walked away angry and upset, saying, he's just such an ungrateful person. Right? There's my test, you see. I didn't get the f feedback I wanted, and all of a sudden now I'm upset with the person, Whereas if I gave from my heart, I wouldn't would be upset. I go, okay, no worries. I won't do it again for you. Then that's okay. Just follow my. Uh, but when I'm in my ego, I'm now going. I believe this is right with my whole heart. And the problem with this is, we will then have a tendency to make out that no matter what the law of attraction is bringing me, because of my soul's condition that it can't be bringing me something to expose that because that is already good within me that's what I believe right. right so I already believe that that's good so I don't need to look at that so you know what I do instead I look at that I might deal with that and I look at that and I might deal with that even and I look at that and I might deal with that all the while the law of attraction is still bringing me the same events because the event that's actually created this particular law of attraction, the, in other words, the unhealed emotional condition that creates the law of attraction, is this one, and I don't want to touch that because I think that's good. Right. And this is the trouble we face in our day-to-day -day life. It's often the things that we think are good that are not as good as what we think. And often we hold on to those things thinking that they're good when they are in fact creating a whole series of negative events in our life that we don't want to face that that is the creator of. And so what we do is we do all sorts of things to justify what happens. We go, oh, that negative event must be something else. It must be someone else doing it. It must be, oh, I'm getting attacked by spirits. That's what it is. Or, or whatever. We come up with all these different reasons other than it being the thing it is, which is the particular thing that God is saying to us, basically, through the law of attraction, this is what it is that you need to look at. But we're holding on for dear life, going, no, 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 that's my treasured possession. That's the thing that I think is good about me. Do you follow me? Yeah, I follow very clearly. Yeah. Yeah. And also my excuse is always, oh, it must have been a misunderstanding, or I didn't express myself clearly enough, or it's not my native language, English, and... And then I wholeheartedly believe that's the reason. Yeah, so, so the ego comes up well, with all of these alternative yeah. explanations. Yeah, yeah so uh, I've got a language barrier. Right? Yeah, or if they would listen to me, to my explanation, then they would understand it. Right, so I'm not understood. Not understood. So Instead this is of just accepting what I did, wasn't a good thing. Well, in society, well, accepting it's a good thing. Well, accepting that the event came to you, and it came to you because of something inside of your own soul condition. That's yeah. why the event came. Yeah. And it's there to expose an emotion inside of your own soul condition. Yeah. Now, it could be that the emotion is I'm not understood, but I doubt that very much. Mm -hmm. Because... If we deal with the emotion that we're not understood, and then the very next day another similar event happens which we feel we're not understood with, then that's telling me that that's not the cause. Because if I healed the cause within myself emotionally, 
the event would not occur again. That's the acid test. If the event continues occurring, one after the other, then that's telling me that I have yet to deal with the actual cause. And then what I, for myself, what I do is I go, yeah, I'm highly suspicious. It's probably something that I think is good about myself that's the problem, right? Not something that I think is bad about myself. Normally those problems you go through pretty rapidly. It's the things that you think that are good about yourself that you don't want to let go of and you don't want to listen to God about that cause a lot of resistance, yeah? And, uh, and usually, if you allow yourself to look at it, you will, you will then see. So, so, for example, for myself at the moment, one of the things that I've felt good about myself about has been this big longing that I have for my soulmate. Right? However, now I can see that actually my longing is tainted by some feelings that I have about still missing her. So in other words, I've still got some grief to work my way through about missing her, right? Particularly missing her for the last 48 years, uh, that I still have to feel. And, and I need to let myself feel them. Even though Mary's in my life, I still miss her. And the reason why I still miss her is because Mary's quite blocked to me at times, and under those times, I miss her. <laughs> Does that make sense? But, but the reality is if I had healed that completely, Mary could be blocked to me and I would not miss her, I would just desire her still. Do you see the difference? So there's obviously an emotion inside of me and I've got to work on it and find out what it is and look at it. Does that make sense? So the key is to look at the things that you hold dear within yourself about yourself because there's likely a large amount of investment in that emotionally. So how come that others feel what's coming out of my soul on a subconscious level? But I don't. Oh, it's not clear to me. Well, for a start, you're not looking for it. Um, but, but the law of attraction works perfectly. God designed a perfect law so that whatever your soul attracts is definitely what your soul needs to attract in order to heal itself. So the reality is that everything that we attract is purpose-built in terms of the law, so that we can get closer to God. The reason why other people can feel it more than we can is because they probably have not had the same amount of detunement from it that we have had from our childhood. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in other words, they haven't grown up in exactly the same fertile ground as you have in order to retain that particular emotion. So they haven't grown up with the same parents in the same situation, with the same environment, with the same fears and the same projections as you have. For that reason, they can often be more sensitive to what's wrong in us than we can be sensitive in what's wrong ourselves. That's the reason yeah. why they often see it and feel it more readily than we do. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Yep. Now this gets back to the f question that Louisa asked me earlier. And that question is a good question. Why don't I connect to God even though I want to? Or I might just put in here, even though I think I want to. Now, the reason why is because a lot of the times existing within our soul is an emotion which is the opposite of what we would like it to be. So, so for example, we may have an emotion, of, I really want God, might be the feeling, or let's call it a thought at this point. So the thought would be, I want God. But the feeling that I might have at exactly the same time might be if I have God, God will control me. Now, I might have that thought and that feeling at exactly the same time. Right? Now, if I have that thought and that feeling at exactly the same time, what is the dominant prayer? What's the prayer to God? Can you see it's the second one? I'm really saying to God, I'm scared of you controlling me. Now, of course, if God loves us, he's never going to control us. But we're scared of it. There's an emotion inside of us that causes us to fear it. Now, a lot of times it's the emotion that's caused through us being connected with Christianity in the past or some other 
feeling that we have where we think we have to abdicate our own will in order to do God's will and all of those kind of teachings, which are all erroneous, but cause us to have an emotion like this. If we can just get the mic to you, she's just behind you. Um, yeah, I think I have that emotion about men. Okay. So you're going to have a masculine a projection of God's your father, this sort of feeling, and yeah, he's going to want to control me. If I, if I love God and receive God's love, then God wants me to do what God wants rather than I, I'm not allowed to do what I want anymore. And if I'm not allowed to do what I want anymore, do I really want God? Sort of like, now I've got the hand up going, no, I don't know if I really want God. So this is why... We often don't connect to God because the real emotion is very different to the thought. To actually connect with God, we need to have the real emotion. We need to feel the real emotion. So we're better off yelling and screaming at God, telling God how much we don't want him because he's going to control us, than we are going, oh, please give me some of your love, while at the same time feeling that God's going to control us. Um, Mary and I were just talking the other day about Forrest Gump again. You know the movie Forrest Gump where Dan, you know the Lieutenant Dan, was on the top of the mast with his legs missing, screaming and yelling at God to bring on his worst in the middle of a hurricane, uh, to bring on his worst um, because of, and letting go of all that rage. And I thought the movie was good in the way that it illustrated Lieutenant Dan after that point. Because there was a calmness and a peacefulness and, a, and a, f a feeling of acceptance and a lot of other things that obviously came to him through that experience. And while that's a fictitious experience, the reality is that the same thing happens to us many times. If we, if we really say the real emotion and really feel the real emotion with passion, we often release it very rapidly and then it's gone for good. But the problem most of us face is we're so much in the facade that we don't want to release the real emotion because we don't want to even admit that we have it. And instead we want to have a different emotion that we believe is the good one, the good girl's emotion or the good boy's emotion, and we try to fill that instead. Now with God, you can't do that. You can't falsify emotions with God because God can feel everything and therefore feel exactly what you feel. So if God's feeling that from you and hearing that from your mouth... Which one is God going to respond to? Second one. The second one. Yeah. And if we be the second one and feel the second one, if we feel that God will control me and we really feel our fear about God controlling us and so forth, and we really express it to God, now we have a chance to heal it. Yeah. And that's the secret to connection. If we're not connecting with God, it's because there's something wrong with how we're falsifying how we feel with God. That's the reason why. Yep. Thank you. No worries. Um, Elizabeth, you've had your hands up many times. Let's go there. Um, this question relates to earlier in the day when you talked about our physical body, our spirit body, mm -hmm. and our soul. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to um, say, as you know, I've dealt with a lot of mental illness in the past. Yep. And about three years ago, I had uh, five bouts of shock treatment. Yep. I just wonder how that relates to physical and whether it impacts on my soul. Um, it certainly impacts on your soul and your physical body and your spirit body. Um, but let's talk about it in a bit more detail. Shock, shock treatment is often used to, in order to treat people with schizophrenia or manic depression or some kind of psychotic episode or illness. So here's our soul. Here's our bodies. Now the sensory apparatus of our bodies... I'll draw, draw a dress, dress for you there. Okay. Be a bit more specific. The sensory apparatus of our body, well, the dress is a bit, it uh, <laughs> doesn't cover over much, that dress. <laughs> okay. It's no good. Elizabeth, Elizabeth's quite uh, modest, so we just have to do that. Thank you. Okay, so we've got the, the, the bodies, the two bodies. Now, when you're receiving shock treatment, it comes through the electrical field of your physical body 
and it does actually connect to your spirit body and it does also the experience flows into your soul as a result of coming through the sensory apparatus of the two bodies. Ironically, if they chose a very, very low voltage that you personally could not feel, it may have done more benefit than harm because you had at the same time spirits connected with you through the silver cord that connects the two bodies together there was a group of spirits with you at the time you understand so this group of spirits is very sensitive to any electrical impulse and if if they had done an electrical impulse that that your physical body felt like sort of tickling rather than a than harm like a shock it's then, under anesthetic sorry it's under anesthetic um, oh, it was done under the anaesthetic, yep. If it was done without any anaesthetic or under, it doesn't really matter with this because it, uh, it wouldn't have been a pain. The spirits would feel it as a pain. And they would automatically in that moment jump out of your connect, their connection with your physical body. Now, there's a very good uh, book written about this subject that was written in the 1930s. And that was the book that's on a PDF that I've given you before. It's on, downloadable on the website. It's, it's the one, 30 Years Among the Dead. And what they used to do is anybody who had some physical or spirit body problems, including depression, they used to give a very low intensity electric shock that wasn't that the physical person couldn't feel very much, but the spirits would jump out of their body and the doctor who was doing it had a wife who was a medium. And the spirits would go to the wife and then the doctor would talk to the spirits, right, who were now talk, through, connected with the wife, and he would talk to them about why they were in the body, why they were connected to the person's body. Very worth reading, because it explains a lot about how spirits influence people and so forth. Unfortunately, the intensity, they put you under an anaesthetic, so that means your physical body is, is no longer sensitive to the pain and full experience. Uh, however, the spirit body and the soul is still sensitive in that state of anaesthesia. So when you, um, although the spirit body is affected energetically by such experiences with anaesthesia. But what happens when you electrocute the physical body then, and this time would have been quite high intensities, the spirits would automatically jump away from your body in that moment and, uh, and therefore have an effect on you for a, a period of time where they are no longer influencing you. Yeah. Yeah. However, um, when they no longer feel there's any danger of getting electrocuted again, what do you think they do? They just go back. Yeah. So then they go back and have as much influence as before. Now, if a person gets the same treatment over and over again, then there's a higher likelihood of those spirits not returning. However, some other spirits might return and still cause issues and problems for the person. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was good. It makes was, complete was, sense to you because yeah. we've had it all happen. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So the original spirits step away for a while. They are quite traumatised by the shock, the electric shock. It affects the spirit body intensely. It feels like an intense, painfully painful experience to the spirit body. And as an as a effect of that is that, that they jump away from the body. And because they are the ones drawing most of the energy from your physical body, they are the ones that are going to receive most of the pain. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Yep. However, some of the pain will pass through your spirit body and therefore enter your soul. So you will have some grief to feel and fear to feel about being electrocuted as a result of, even though you were anaesthetised yeah. at the time. Yeah. What about, it was five times, so it just... Of course. Mostly... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And you were possibly strapped down at the time and... Yeah so that your body wouldn't respond, so there's a feeling of trauma in, the, in that as well. So there'll be a number of feelings of trauma involved with that. that. That'll feel like torture to you emotionally, and so you need to experience that. But the spirits with you, yeah, ex exited, 
and then of course they wait a while, seems everything seems good for a little while, and then of course they come back because they don't feel there's any chance of that happening again, and then, you know, and then of course it happens again, and then they go away, and then they have different spirits come back oftentimes. Yeah, it's worth reading that whole story of 30 Years Among the Dead, yeah, Elizabeth. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Clara, thanks. AJ, when you, when you were in Greece, you talked quite a bit about earth changes. Yeah. And you said that in a few months' time from that, you'd be a little more sure of what was happening. And yet today you talk about going maybe to Chernobyl or whatever. I mean, wh where is this up to? Because you did say that if you were flying after that earthquake that you wouldn't come back. <laughs> You're not up to portaling yet. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how my words get taken out of context, Carol. Like, did I say that I wouldn't fly again? Didn't um, I say, I feel at this point in time that that probably mm. won't happen again? It wasn't a very... I, I thought you said that after... I didn't, wasn't talking just about you, but after the earthquakes over there, that within a thousand kilometres, is what I believed, was that we wouldn't be flying for some time. Oh, I agree with that. When they happen, mm. yeah. And, and you were talking about them happening in like March, April or something, February, March. Oh, I said at the time, I felt that. Can you remember the very first words I said? <laughs> it was your feeling, yeah. Well, I'm just asking you, is that feeling I, this still... Is what I'm a, this is why mm. I'm very reticent to talk about earth change things mm -hmm. with everybody, because the very first words I said was a great big disclaimer yeah. about the condition I was in and what I was feeling at the time and everything else. Mm. And then I said what I said because people asked me what my feelings were. Sure. Right? And then we got into the discussion of fear, didn't we, primarily yeah. over in Greece. Like we were talking mostly about the fears. Now, I just feel that your fear is guiding your question. Mm -hmm. Right? And I'm saying to people over and over again, you need to deal with your fears and act in your desires. Why do you want to know when earth changes are going to occur rather than feel yourself when they're going to occur? Or even better than that, feel what you desire to do and just do it anyway, no matter what, whether they're going to occur or not. So I see people doing things like moving out west where we live. Like, I don't understand that if they don't want to do it. Like, I see people going, oh, I don't know if I really want to do this. It, like, you know, we had such a nice place over home and I just feel we have to do it now because, you know, there's going to be a change events occur. And I'm going, well, why? why? Why move if you really wanted to stay where you were? Like, if, if I really wanted to stay where I was, I wouldn't be moving. Earth change events or not, I still wouldn't be moving. Right? So that's the first thing to bear in mind with earth change events. Like, why do, we, why do we make choices and decisions and ask the questions we do? Mostly because we're afraid. And mostly because we don't want to act in our desires, not the other way around. So what I would be firstly doing, and I wrote this at Greece as well, is firstly work out what you desire to do. Earth changes or not, what will you do? Long term, like not short term. AJ, we've had this discussion a lot over three years mm -hmm. and I'm going to really put myself out there again today yeah. because I have a really strong desire to move somewhere. I've told you about that. And it, no, you don't, Carol. Oh, I'm sorry. I no, do, you don't. AJ. <laughs> you do. don't, Carol. <laughs> you don't. I've Remember I just said... about this and it's not about earth changes. I actually want to change my life. But <laughs> What's happening with the law of attraction? It's not changing. It's not changing. No. So that's telling me that, that, that whatever it is that's attracting the event is, all, is attracting the event exactly as your soul currently wants it. Right. So yeah, That's not helpful though, AJ. <laughs> yes, I know you're being helpful, but I don't feel that as being helpful. Why because, is that? Because... You know, I've asked for a law of attraction in the last year especially, and boy, have I had it. I've had lots of it, honestly, lots of it. And I feel I've, 
I feel I'm going into that. Like I, you know, I cry a lot about this. I got, I'm trying to go to the bottom of this. I got to despair about a month ago, like serious despair. And yeah, yeah uh, but is despair <laughs> the causal emotion? Well, I, I've, I've, I feel I've been to many of the core emotions. I've been, you know. But, but is the event changing? See, see, can you see the cycle we get ourselves in? We go, oh, I'll deal with this emotionally, I've cried about that now emotionally, I've cried about this emotionally, and the event doesn't change. Mm -hmm. I've done this many times, Carol, and trust me, if the event doesn't change, you're not dealing with the emotion. It's just that simple. It's not the emotion that you've dealt with, it's got nothing to do with that. So, so what you need to do is find out what the emotion is. And, and we keep having the same conversation because oh, I keep no, saying no. the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that is, you do not desire to move here. You do not desire to move. Okay. You need to look at why you don't rather than say to yourself that you do. Three years now has proven to you that mm -hmm. you don't. Mm -hmm. Accept it. <laughs> you don't. Right. <laughs> All right? And look at why. Look at why, what, were the, what are the possible reasons why you wouldn't want to? What are your investments in your property? What are your person, like all of this stuff is stuff you need to look at, right? There's still investments, otherwise you would have already been gone. Like, it, it would already have all occurred. Do you follow me? And, and despair, while you feel despair, is really just a lot of the times anger that you're not getting your own way if you look at it like your so-called despair oftentimes is just you're angry with God the universe and God's laws and everything else and AJ half the time too sometimes that you're just not getting your own way you, you, you're seeming to deal with an emotion that and yet nothing changes and I'm saying if nothing changes then you've not changed the emotion that causes the attraction. Oh, I wouldn't say nothing's changed, okay? Things are changing, but the major thing is not changing. Oh, I agree, <laughs> I agree, yeah. which is the same statement as I just made, really, just embellished a little to make you feel better. Yeah. <laughs> right? Thank you, Roger. That's okay. <laughs> the law of attraction is bringing you this event, which is, mm. I think I want to sell, but I can't sell. Mm. I even put it up for auction and I still can't sell. I put it out to mm. tender, I still can't sell. I do all of these different things. I do all of these different things. Mm. I even left it. Yeah. <laughs> and look what mess that made. <laughs> <laughs> Did it not? Yeah. Yes. Because there's got to be something wrong with the core emotion. I didn't emotion. want to go back. <laughs> yeah, I can't agree, but because you're back. And you're there. Yeah, but so I have I a can't big oh, but I have a but look, okay, I, I have a responsibility to the bank because I owe a lot of money, okay? I mean I'm prepared I am really now prepared to walk out with nothing and and I c I can't even give it away. The bank won't even take the keys. They don't want it either. But <laughs> they just want to keep charging a lot of money. Okay, so help me here because I am really stuck. You don't want help, Carol. Oh, God. We've I talked about this issue for three years, as demonstrated, you don't. However, mm. I will answer the question, okay. which is different than helping. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fear dominates your choices and decisions in this matter. Fear is the only thing causing you to make the choices and decisions you're trying to make. And while fear becomes your dominating issues in your life, nothing good can actually occur, really. But you're totally unwilling to deal with your fear. You don't even believe you have much fear in you, inside of you at all. That's the reality. You feel you have very little fear. Right? But fear is dominating your very question. With earth change events, it's all about the fear. It's all, that's why the fear dominates the question. So the key is to start being honest about your fear. What fears are driving your choices and decisions? Remember I once said to you, three years ago, that you could own the property and still be free. 
Yeah. And you said, how can I be free? I own the property, I've got all this debt, and I've got all this, and I've got to pay the banks, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do that. I said, no, no, you can own the property and still have all the debt and still be free. And at the time, you gave that very little consideration because you disagreed. Right? You don't feel that you can be free while you have this property. You don't feel that you have any freedom of movement, any freedom in your life, and so forth. But I put to you, the last year has proven that you do have quite a little bit of freedom because you actually managed to go overseas and you managed to do quite a lot of other things, yeah. right? even though you had the same problem. But the emotion still isn't dealt with, the emotion of fear that is driving your very questions. Now, the law of attraction is telling you you do not wish to sell. Okay, I'll believe you. <laughs> no, you don't, I don't but believe I'll proceed. You. No, I'm finding it really <laughs> hard to believe, AJ. Okay. Really hard. <laughs> let's, just, let's just continue with the discussion rather than you trying to agree with something you don't agree with, all right? The law of attraction is bringing you an event. The event is you cannot sell the property you think you want to sell. And I've said to you for the last three years that you don't want to sell it. Because I can feel a lot of the emotions inside of you that I can feel mean that you're not going to sell it because you don't want to. Now a lot of them have to do with your soul and its perception of itself. So there's your half of the soul, you. Yeah. And there's a particular perception of yourself that you have that you wish to retain, right? And you are heavily invested in the property emotionally because of the perception of yourself that it actually gives you. Right? And for that reason, giving up your property is going to have a huge effect on your soul emotionally that you don't wish it to have. So even if you sold it, it would still have a huge effect on your soul. So you, you want to maintain a perception of yourself and this property gives you and helps you maintain this perception. Now, any time we have a perception of ourselves, it's always because we are afraid of what our real self is. You understand? We are afraid of what we really are inside. And so what we do is we create a facade, a perception of ourselves, this wall here, the perception of ourselves, in order to protect ourselves from knowing what our real self feels. And there is a link between that and why you wish to retain your property. Now I acknowledge that you do have a desire to sell your property from a financial perspective. Because you're terrified actually about the financial perspective. I do also acknowledge that you have a desire to sell your property from an earth change perspective. And one of the main reasons why you're doing that is because you're terrified as well about the earth change perspective. Actually, I, I, I don't think it is that with this property. If but you anyway, knew you what it, it is, okay. you would have already sought out this problem. Every time I make a statement, okay. when I've talked to you about this, you always say, no, I don't feel it's that, AJ. I don't feel it's that. No, I don't think I feel that at all. Just experiment with a bit for, with, with what I'm saying to you instead of going, no, I don't feel that. No, I don't feel that. No, I don't feel okay. that. Okay. Because the reality is if you knew what it was, this problem would already be resolved. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So, so instead of going, no, I don't feel that, no, I don't feel that, I'm, so, I'm saying to you, you ask the questions about earth changes very frequently. And you ask them because you have a lot of fear associated with them that you do not believe you have. Remember I said that earlier. You do not believe you have much fear in you at all, is what I said. Okay. And the reality is you do have a lot of fear in you, but you do not believe you have much. Now, I'm not talking about fear of your own physical, personal safety necessarily. I'm talking about more emotional fears that you have, which are quite large, right? That dominate a lot of your actions. And one of your emotional fears is this perception of yourself. 
you do not wish your real self to be known and you wish to hold on to the facade self and your property assists you in doing so. It helps you maintain a belief about yourself that you have that you wish to retain. And if you didn't have the property, it would almost like be giving up a child. It would almost be like giving up. And, and the reason why is because it would be giving, attempt, you'd have to start looking at giving up the perception of yourself that you actually have. Now, every time I say something to you on these subjects, one thing that goes through you is, I don't feel that. You often say to me, and when you don't say it, I can feel you feel it quite frequently, you often say or feel, I don't agree with that. And I'm not asking you to agree with me. I'm asking, I'm just saying to you, your law of attraction is proof that nothing has changed on this issue. Yeah. You follow me? Yeah, I do. And this is something, this is a very good teaching point for everybody. If our law of attraction does not change, then our emotion has not changed. We have not found the causal emotional reason the issue of love, it's always an issue of love. We have not found the causal issue of love that has attracted the event. Do, do you follow me? If the law of attraction is bringing the same event, then it means that we have not changed the cause for the law of attraction to bring us the same event. No matter how much thinking we have done, and no matter how much emotions we have processed, we have not processed the thing related to the event. Now, I understand your frustration, trust me. I have had things inside of myself emotionally that I've had since the day I began this process or this path again, and I still have them right now. But unlike you, I don't tell myself that it's something else other than my own law of attraction and operation. I understand. Like, I wear these still. Why? Because they, I have not, at this point in time, released the cause of that to be needed. Do you understand? That's why. And I am patient with myself, and I'm, 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 I'm not telling myself that you're to blame for not telling me why I could lose these glasses. And I'm not telling myself that. But occasionally you tell yourself that I'm to blame for you not getting rid of your property. And I am not telling God that God's to blame for this either, or that there's something wrong with God's law for this. Does that make sense? I am constantly saying to myself, mm, I have, and Mary knows this, I have not dealt with this emotion yet. Now, when my eyesight changes, and sometimes it does during the course of a day change, and I get perfect clear right, during the course of a day, and then it goes back to how it is now, which is your face is very blurry, and I can barely see your eyes from this distance. Mm -hmm. I can just see them as dark holes. <laughs> really, that's all I see until I put these on, right? But sometimes during the course of a day, I can see a person from that distance perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I always forget what the emotion was just before it that caused me to do that. Which tells me that I don't want to know what this is about emotionally. Do you understand? And so what I do firstly is I go, oh, okay, I don't want to know. So it doesn't matter how much I say I want to know, I don't want to know. And I start talking to God about why don't I want to know. And what, in this process, what I've realized is there's some very big things that I have not wanted to face and see. Does that make sense for this foot to the square? And I'm only just going through some of them. One of them was with Mary and what Mary's been doing in the sleep state and so forth. I have not wanted to like know and see and do something about that. Right? So that was one of the issues. But there's other issues related to God and also my future that I don't want to see, that I'm, that I'm shutting down. And I, re I realise that I have to go through and feel what I'm afraid of to actually see it. And once I see it and process through it emotionally, the grief that's closing down my eyes will release and I'll be able to see as if I've got my glasses on. Mm -hmm. Now, that is no different to your situation. 
The only difference, though, between us is that you keep blaming everything externally and you're saying that it's got nothing to do with any one of your emotions. And I'm saying to you constantly, no, no, it has everything to do with your emotions and you need to allow yourself to see how attached to your property you are and how it defines you and how much fear you have of letting that go. Can you, do you know what's under that fear? I mean, can you point me in a direction of that? No. Like, I can, but I'm not going to. Okay. Can I tell you why? Yeah. Because the only thing that's going to help you is for you to feel this fear, actually feel it. Right? I, I can tell you what it is, but is that going to help you feel it? It will actually probably make you even worse. Because what happens when you know a fear in advance? What do you normally do? Avoid it. Right? So me actually saying what the fear is will possibly help you avoid it even further. Yeah. To use all these intellectual tools plus a few additional ones that you haven't created yet yeah. in order to avoid it. Yeah. At least now we have a limited amount of mm. like, ways in which you control this fear. Mm. But the, rea the reality is if you can allow yourself to actually feel the fear, to feel it in your body, to feel it in your life, to feel it in your, all, many of your questions and many of your decisions, to feel how afraid you are, mm -hmm. you will actually find that you'll feel the fear and then the emotion that is underneath the fear that is actually related to the law of attraction event that you're creating will be able to be released. That makes sense? Now at the moment I understand your frustration with that process. I have had these problems, this problem here, for, for a lot longer than you've had your property. You understand? And I've known about it for a lot longer than you've wanted to get rid of your property and yet I still have the problem. So I understand the frustration you feel, but that doesn't change the truth I'm telling you. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So it's very important for you to allow. At the moment, many of us are, are not even allowing the concept of fear and how much it pervades our life. Many of us are not even allowing that to become a part of our awareness. So we need to allow it to become a part of our awareness. Yeah? And that's why I've given so many talks about fear. Because it's a major problem we face in terms of getting ourselves away, you know, away from trying to avoid it and into feeling it. Because it has to be felt through in order for us to, prog to progress. Many of us believe we have no fears at all. But I put to you that the only reason why you're not at one with God right at this moment is because of your fear. That applies to all of us. The only reason why all of us are not at one with God right at this moment is because we are all afraid at some level of some things, some of us more than others, and that is what prevents us from actually getting to the underlying causal emotion that will resolve our problems. Does that make sense? Now, I'm sorry, but I must leave it there if I can, because I just noticed it's five to six, and, uh, and it's, so it's getting pretty late. So, Mary, you want to do? Yeah. Well, what about this? No? Fire away. I just wanted to um, say hi to you all. <laughs> Uh, formally um, and just as you've been talking this afternoon it was really beautiful to feel the the shifting questioning after the break to a lot more soul focused uh, questions and I've been standing back there reflecting on my last few weeks and um, and I just wanted to say a few things to you all about the power of actually living in your soul and desiring your soul because um, that's something that I feel I'm finally stepping towards. I feel in the last few weeks I've probably grown the most um, that I have since I met AJ. And um, for those of you, how many of you were at the talk last weekend? 
Oh yeah, fair number. And I was um, at that talk. I related a story that began with me um, a couple of weeks ago, really putting in a heartfelt prayer to God to actually feel my soul and feel who I am rather than the version of me that uh, I would like to maintain. And in the course of my story, I related what had happened immediately following that, which was um, uncovering quite a lot of shame within myself about things that I was currently engaged in in the sleep state, but also the realisation of how much anger I was carrying in my soul about love and soulmates and how powerless I really felt uh, and a lot of fear and a lot of grief that I knew was under all of that. Uh, and, um, and then I realised I, I, I probably, in my true soul, wanted to share that with you because I thought perhaps um, it might help you guys grow. And I said to Joy at the beginning uh, that sometimes on this path I get these feelings like, are you kidding, God? I've got to face this and then talk about it? <laughs> it was quite challenging for me, as you probably noticed last week. Um, but I wanted to share with you that in the week following that, uh, a lot of really powerful things have been happening mm. for the both of us. And um, when I spoke to you last, I still had quite a lot of rage inside of me uh, as I related. And um, I've one of the reasons why I don't have much voice at the moment is that I spent quite a lot of time uh, really having to own that rage. I really didn't want to own it. and. Um, but I did, and it, it's awesome because um, I really feel myself connecting deeper to some of my fear and grief already within a week. Uh, so some, I know a lot of you spend a lot of time focused on processing, and what I'm learning is that we need to focus on living in our soul, and then we will process what is pertinent to what the law of attraction is bringing us. When we're examining our law of attraction from our mind or our intellect and then trying to find the feeling that is must be triggered, similar to Carol's story, uh, what could this be about? Okay, I'll try and connect to that. I feel we're not, we're not even really on the path at that point either or we're not, I hate that term on the path, but we're not going for God in that moment. Uh, it's really... Uh, for me, been this desire to own my soul, to feel my soul, whatever that is, and my facade has been screaming at me, <laughs> hey, this is not the kind of person I want you to be. I want you to be much nicer and, and prettier and not as loud and angry. Um, but the truth of my soul is that that's what I've been carrying around and projecting outwards. So um, I think where I'm heading is just to say that it's really powerful and wonderful if you can have the courage because it does take courage to really look into your soul as it really is right now and uh, I know I've still got a long long way to go with a lot of those emotions but um, just going back to the discussion that AJ had with Lorleen about the soul and the emotions that re repel and the ones that draw together uh, I'm owning a lot of emotions that have made me want to push against AJ and even in that very process of owning it I feel we come so much closer together just in those moments would you agree yeah, totally. like um, the so you don't have to be through it all you just have to want your own soul and immediately there's an openness to the other half of you and an attraction already there so it's interesting this week that when Mary was has been expressing her rage I suppose you would definitely call it um, I've actually, I actually can feel Mary better and I feel ha happy that something now is changing than I could feel before. Because before what I was feeling was all of this avoidance of the rage and avoidance of the fear. And it was like, like I've described, it's like trying to touch Mary through a great big sheath, you know, like, try, but, but now, it, like when Mary expressed her, um, her anger a lot this week and some of it's angry with me and what I have done or have meant to have done in the first century and a lot of it's really towards God and the concept of soulmates and yeah. the f f love and towards yeah. me even existing yeah. is, a, is a fair bit of anger about my existence and so forth and um, so I've had a lot of grief to feel about it but 
but the good thing about it is that is that it felt like for the first time Mary's actually being truthful with me about how she really feels um, and then I could just feel my feelings about that instead of before what I was feeling is no darling you're not being truthful about how you really feel and and people have asked me well didn't AJ know you were angry didn't he say you were angry and the truth is he did he'd say look I feel like you're angry with me and I would do the intellectual thing okay okay yeah okay probably yep anger what could the anger be about rather than just owning the anger and letting the anger or if you even got that far a lot of times a lot of times I said no I'm not angry (laughs) you know like I don't really feel angry or whatever and um and as Mary's found this week, she's pretty angry. Yeah. <laughs> but but the the beauty of it is it actually feels like I'm getting the real Mary now. And, and if, that feels really good. Yeah. If yeah. you think about, uh, I think we spoke to you about our stuff a uh, couple of months ago as well when I'd just been living on my own for a couple of months. And AJ said a similar thing that uh, he felt like he could touch me finally. Mm. Um, and so it's been this gradual unravelling, I suppose, of my facade since probably three or four months ago. And I guess it's just really deepening at the moment to mm. really feeling what's there. And I feel this is where the path kicks into gear. You know, you, you can really grow rapidly from that point. Yeah. yeah. So it's really important to face this truth, and that is when our law of attraction does not really change, that something's not changing in our soul. And it's really important to just come to terms with that. Now, it can take many months or even years for us to do that. As I've said to you, it has taken me many years to even come to terms with some of the injuries that I have, emotional injuries that I have that are affecting different things physically. And, um, And you've just got to be patient with yourself about it. But also look at the fear. It's the fear primarily that stops the entire process. And... To be frank, fear is what is dominating this planet. Fear dominates it at the moment. And of course, therefore, it's going to dominate us individually because of it dominating the planet. And any time we cannot feel God or feel our soulmate or feel ourselves, most of the time it's related to a fear of some kind. Uh, Once you release the fear then you get into the causal emotional sadness and grief. It's very simple to get into it when your fear is gone. When your fear is present, it's pretty hard, eh? Many of you have experienced that. So just encourage you to persist about that. Mary's been persistent, even though she's had a lot of fear for four years or so. And now you're starting to really feel your fear, aren't you? Like I the am, fear that you have I am, about love. But I fully acknowledge I'm not through it and it might take me (laughs) a while because I know a lot of us uh, and I know a lot of you feel like we're standing up here and teaching you this stuff and talking about it and and therefore we must have mastered it all and uh, the truth is no (laughs) I haven't Asia has much more than me but as he just said he's not perfect in it either it's just that we're relaying things that we remember really um, as truths Mm. and we're endeavouring to walk it so that we might show you <laughs> by example. So what we're doing is, um, as Mary just said, we're remembering things and we're telling you what we remember. But that doesn't mean that we've got it down pat in terms of coming from a condition of sin or coming from our own emotional injuries that we have due to reincarnation. It doesn't mean that we have it down pat yet ourselves. And that's something to bear in mind as well. But I think uh, it's time for us all to stop, I think. You've been exhausted today. (laughs) Probably partly my exhaustion that I'm feeling. Um, So we look forward to catching up with you in December sometime, either here or uh, over our way where we live, um, or down in uh, New South Wales, uh, where we'll be sometime in December as well. Um, We're getting a lot of new DVDs uh, produced at the moment. There's the new ones that have done there today. But there's another 32 titles that... uh, They've never been on DVD before. Never been on DVD before, which are now going to be available sometime in December or January. Um, And that means that we're about, about just over halfway through the titles or just a bit over half, I think. 
Sorry, there's 70 total. 70 left. To go. That's 30 of them. So we've still got 40 titles that we're yet to... to uh, some of them are two DVDs, so it's 40 DVDs we're yet to do. But, but Igor's done, what is it, it must be 30, it must be, well it's nearly 50 already, which is a lot of work, as you can imagine. So we'd That's just like to thank him for that. That's why we need to take a break from talking so Igor can catch up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, and, uh, and what we're thinking of doing in the future is also doing some recordings of interviews that we have planned. We're just getting all the material together to do the interviews. And uh, we're hoping that will begin sometime in December or January. And the interviews will be things that you'll be able to, we'll be producing them onto YouTube talks and DVDs and, uh, and so what we're hoping is that uh, the interviews will be a good way of showing a person the answers to a, a group of questions that are of the same type of questions. So, so we feel that uh, the way we'll structure the interviews are more along the lines of asking questions about one piece of information that uh, we'll try to put together a, a concise answers to over a period of maybe four hours of interviews or so. And that way, when you give somebody a DVD or refer them to YouTube, they'll be able to watch a, that particular subject and get quite a concise and complete explanation on the particular subject without having to go through all of these different things all over the place. One of the things that I'm really hoping that we do uh, in that interview process is a really concise um, thing about homosexuality because that's mentioned so many different places in so many different talks mm. but just to have it all in one spot will be really yep. beneficial for people. So it's going to give us the opportunity to deliver a lot of material uh, that maybe not even has been delivered already um, but in a nice concise format. So for that reason we'll be actually having a bit less seminars in the new year uh, and actually placing more of these interviews on YouTube and also potentially on DVD um, for you to, to look at and get. And that, that will enable us uh, to perhaps reach, reach a larger audience as well, um, which is our intention in the new year. So, so anyway, we just thought we'd let you know that that's what we're going to do over the coming year. So there'll still be occasional meetings together, probably one or two a month. But uh, they won't, there won't be anywhere near as many as we've been having over the last three years. However, we are putting forward to, we are making uh, God's Way of Love events that would be more frequent. So the event like that we had down at uh, Kentucky, down at the Kyabra, uh, planting the trees down there, and other types of similar events and all different events that reflect to the different teams, we will be doing more of those kind of events where you can enjoy each other's company, do a combination of different things together and learn in the process as well. So, so that's the kind of events we're wanting to plan for the new year as well. But we'd like to thank you guys for your time thank again you, today. Everyone. And for your donations. And for your donations and today. Your listening ears. Yeah. And I'm sorry that I've been in the space I have been today, which is quite uh, disconnected in comparison with normal. Um, but I'll be working on it over the next few weeks. I've got a fair bit of grief I can feel that I need to feel. So hopefully the next few weeks will give me the chance to feel that and then, uh, then you'll find me back to my happy self. <laughs> so we'll catch you later, guys. <laughs>